Hello. Um, welcome and thank you uh, for joining the latest Art Talks event, which is this afternoon on what is the future of digital technology in school. Uh, my name is Will Hazel and I'm the education correspondent for the I newspaper. And I'm uh, delighted to be hosting uh, today's event, which is on a, a fascinating and extremely important topic. Um, the pandemic has obviously transformed the way that schools are using digital technology. I think if we were to um, go back a year and a half, two years ago, um, no one would have believed that schools would be operating in the way they are now. Um, but of course, it's also thrown up some very significant challenges and highlighted some stark educational inequalities. Um, so now as we move out of hopefully uh, the crisis phase of this pandemic, um, thoughts are understandably turning um, to how schools could and should uh, use digital technology in the future. Um, before I introduce the panel, I'm going to um, run through some housekeeping as well as the structure of um, the events this evening. Um, we're going to hear from each of our panel um, who will be speaking um, for about five or 10 minutes. Um, we'll then have a discussion between uh, the panel, um, after which I'm pretty, um, I'm very keen for us to make sure uh, that we have about 20 minutes to, to get questions from you. So if you have any questions, we've already received some, um, then please do pop them into the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your screen. Um, I've also been uh, told to inform you that closed captions are available. Um, so if you want to turn them on, um, I think you can click, click that on at the bottom of the screen. Um, and just to, to make everyone aware, uh, you can all relax. You can't be seen or heard um, during this event, um, but the session is uh, being recorded. Um, so, Without further ado, I'll introduce the panel. Um, firstly, we have Lauren Thorpe, who's Director of Strategy at ARC Schools. Uh, previously, she was a principal of a free school in South East London. Um, she knows a lot about uh, digital technology in education, uh, having a, an undergraduate degree in computer sciences and a master's in ICT in education. And she also sits on the DfE's EdTech Advisory Board. So welcome, Lauren. Uh, next, we have Rosalind Goat, who leads the Department for Opportunities at the Social Mobility Foundation. Um, prior to uh, her current role, Ros uh, worked for Portland Communications, working on uh, behalf of a number of major companies uh, here in the UK. Um, next, we have a man who needs little introduction, but I shall give him one anyway. Um, Andreas Schleicher, who is Director for Education and Skills at the OECD. Um, and of course, the man who initiated and oversees uh, the PISA International Education League tables. Um, Andreas was once uh, famously described by Ma Michael Gove as the most important man in English education. And then finally, um, last but very much not least, we have Rhys Spears, who is head of ARC Greenwich Free School. Um, and Rhys has worked in the education system for 21 years um, and has been a senior leader in South London schools since 2007. So we're going to kick off with Lauren, who I believe is going to talk about um, how ARC responded to some of the challenges which were thrown up by the pandemic when it arrived. So Lauren, if you could uh, kick us off, please. Good afternoon and thank you, Will. Um, so I think uh, we were always aware of the extent to which our children's homes are so very different, um, both within and across all of our schools. But during the first lockdown last spring, we saw more starkly than ever, um, the scale of the difference in opportunity and access and in equipment that was available to our learners at home. We, we conducted a survey internally that told us that fewer than half of our families could print at home, which led to a quick rethinking of some of the remote learning resources that we were providing. Only 44% of our pupils had access to a suitable device for learning of their own, which was something that we think is really crucial if you're going to be able to access remote learning. Um, and too many of our children 
relied on pay-as-you-go internet access or didn't have any broadband at all. Um, so despite the, the strong alignment that we have across our schools with regards to teaching the learning approaches and with regards to curriculum, we were not able to provide a consistent experience to all of our pupils across the network during that first lockdown period. So we were really keen already that we wanted to embed more digital within our schools and in our approaches. But after seeing the scale of that digital inequity across our pupils, we took the decision to accelerate our plans to ensure that all of our pupils from key stage two upwards, so that's year three upwards, have a Chromebook so that they can close that provision gap at home um, and support their own learning and support schools in closing gaps in their learning as well. So in the first instance, these will be a sort of extension to their learning in school with most pupils keeping their devices at home. Um, there, there will be Chromebooks. And this means that teachers will be able to set home learning tasks that are aligned to the curriculum and embedded within the curriculum. They'll be able to use platforms, adaptive learning tools to both diagnose gaps in knowledge and be able to support pupils in closing those gaps. And we're also really excited about the opportunity for schools to provide opportunities for learners to extend their learning beyond the classroom. And I've got a couple of examples of what that means. So um, we've already seen the, the powerful impact that this can have as a couple of quick examples. Our music team led some amazing cross school music events whilst our schools were closed. And we've seen how we could, we could have more powerful cross network opportunities for our students to work together and participate in different things. Uh, which is really exciting. We've had um, book reviews in Key Stage 5 with English students across schools talking together. Um, and all of that has been made possible by the fact that we can, we can sort of extend that learning day and extend some of those opportunities because we've got devices in the hands of pupils outside of those typical school hours. So we've got four components to our digital strategy that we're really excited about developing. One is about that creating more time for learning. So increasing the time and opportunity that students have to extend the time that they are learning. Um, that might involve pupils watching a video um, where a teacher models a new concept, or it might mean that they get to access some slides to pre-read in advance of the lesson. So that in the classroom where the devices are not there most of the time, the teacher can focus on the sort of higher leverage skills and activities that they want to develop. So having a really rich discussion and spending more time doing that because the model has already been sort of absorbed by pupils. So that's the sort of thing we'd like to be able to do more of. We also want our pupils to be more confident online. We want to develop their agency. We want them to be able to navigate the online opportunities that are available and relevant to them both now and in the future and be able to discern which are and are not appropriate and suitable um, and of interest to them. So we really want to work on developing the metacognitive skills of our pupils to enable them to do that more effectively. And we want to really support and build on the work that we've done while schools were closed, where parents had a really um, much more visible experience of their child's education. We want to maintain the best bits of that where, where parents have got access and are able to understand what their children are learning by providing timely, accurate information about the progress that they're making, about the curriculum that they're following, and provide um, support to parents to empower them to be more involved and more sort of more confident actors in their child's learning. And we want to drive towards finally a, a sort of more sustainable model of schooling, I think, where we, we can reduce the time that teachers spend on administrative tasks, um, where we think about uh, at one extreme and at the other extreme, just, just you know, be better for the environment and save money and on, on printing and trees. So um, you know, we want to look at it across across all areas, really, from a sustainability perspective. So, I mean, we're really excited. We're at the beginning of what is going to be a, I think, a, a, both a long, but also rapid, actually, <laughs> transformation over the next few years, where, you know, we're looking both within our network at the pockets of good practice and really excited to hear what what Reese is doing and um, when he talks about um, what Greenwich are doing we've got such great examples across our network of, of some really innovative work in across loads of different areas um, we're looking at, to the rest of the world parts of which are still in remote learning contexts and trying to understand what, what's happening there that we can learn from and and I think that the last 12 months have just led to such a massive change in the use of technology 
amongst learners, there's been a massive and rapid investment in ed tech as a sector, which I think is going to influence and shape the, the availability of technology and tools as we move forward. And I think my, my overwhelming response to all of that is we need to proceed with caution and with, but with enthusiasm so that we're able to make the most of the opportunities that, that it affords, but be flexible enough and adaptable enough to make sure we, we evaluate as we go and, and continue to make the right choices um, when we look at digital tools. Great, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, and next we have Roz, who I think is gonna be talking a bit about some of the Social Mobility Foundation's findings around the digital divide. I think we've got a, a video to start us off. But uh, Roz, over to you. Thanks. And th yeah, thank you very much for having me on the panel today. Um, for those of you who don't kind of know the SMF uh, that well, just a kind of quick introduction. So we're a, na a national charity. Um, we work across the whole of the UK and have been going for about 15 years. Um, we're focused on making practical improvements in social mobility. Um, and we do that in three ways. So we run a program for a cohort of 2000 young people a year, all of whom are on free school meals, supporting those young people firstly into the top universities and then into the top professions. Um, we run an annual social mobility employer index, which looks at the role employers can play in improving social mobility in the UK. Um, and then finally, the, the Department for Opportunities, which is our newest, the newest string to our bow, which is our kind of advocacy and campaigning arm which is really looking um, at systemic change and how to support kind of all young people um, outside of our cohort. Um, and yeah, just, just to kind of set a bit of context um, to what we've seen through the pandemic, I was just going to play a quick video um, from our End Laptop Poverty campaign. Imagine a world in which all school classrooms are locked and only some of the kids are allowed a key to get in. Any child without a key, no matter how bright or eager to learn, isn't allowed an education or the same opportunities. You can stop imagining because that is how laptop poverty is affecting the lives of 1.78 million children in this country. Due to the pandemic, remote learning is the new normal. Schools are closed and the only way children can take part in the education system is by having a laptop or a tablet. That is their key. Any child without a device is living in laptop poverty. They can't take part in live lessons, complete assignments or even do their homework. Ignoring laptop poverty is ignoring a child who wants to learn but can't. It is giving up on their potential. Kids with laptops are 234% more likely to get competitive GCSE results than those without. Kids with laptops will earn an estimated £100,000 more in their lifetimes than those without. The government isn't doing enough. They are acting slowly and falling short. But with your help, we can end laptop poverty in a matter of months. There are over 40 million unused laptops and tablets in this country. Those unwanted devices are gathering dust when they could literally change lives. We're asking you to wipe it, donate it and talk about it. Whether you're a business or an individual, all you need to do is wipe your unwanted machines, donate them to our charity partners across the country and share our message so others do the same. More information is available at endlaptoppoverty.org. With your help, we can end laptop poverty and give children the key to a proper education and future they deserve. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think I mean, I think that kind of that sets out some of the kind of stark figures uh, that young people were kind of working through during um, during the pandemic. And I kind of really welcome um, what ARC has been doing to support its young people. But I think it's probably just worth reiterating that there are still plenty of young people up and down the country who don't have um, access to their own device, despite the kind of government's attempts at a rollout. Uh, so quick, quick campaign plug, please, uh, if you are watching and you do have an old device, do go on the On Laptop Poverty website and donate it. Um, we still have students and I know there's lots of other young people across the country who are without a device. Um, I think just kind of quickly, the kind of key things for us are firstly just reiterating the, the link between the digital divide and um, closing the attainment gap. Uh, the kind of stat that was pulled out in that video um, was, was really compelling in terms of uh, attainment and access to a device. So young people are twice as likely to get um, five A stars to C's in their GCSEs if they have their own device. Um, and on a practical level, um, although devices are a kind of crucial element, um, it's also about access to broadband, which I, I know Lauren touched on. 
Um, from our own student surveys, we know that a third of our young people don't have access to reliable broadband. Um, and the consequences just really extend beyond the classroom. I think um, one of the, th the key things that comes through from our students time and time again is poor Wi-Fi, lack of device also means um, a lack of ability to, to join work experience schemes, to be involved in internships, um, to access some of the kind of events and stuff that the SMF have been doing. Um, so the impact really, really does kind of go well beyond just the access to education in the classroom. And that is that obviously has massive implica implications in terms of social mobility and, and, and closing that divide. Um, from, from our perspective, I think um, in the short term, the area that we're kind of concerned about that's coming up uh, in the not too distant future is around those young people who have had access to devices via their schools, but perhaps um, are finishing school, but looking to retake exams in, in the autumn um, if they're not happy with their results in the summer. Um, so we're keen for kind of schools to look at how they can support young people who decide to, to, to take that approach. Um, and then in the long term, um, we're really keen to see that the government looks at uh, a strategic review around digital inclusion in, in, in light of the kind of findings from the pandemic. Um, completely agree with stuff that um, UNICEF UK have, have put forward around the Department for Education needing to do a comprehensive mapping to understand where young people don't have a device, where they don't have access to online facilities um, and, and the implications for that. Um, and I think the kind of one thing we'd add to that and the, the sort of step change that we really want to see is it's not just about the basics. Yes, it's obviously essential that uh, all young people have access to a device and are able to learn um, either remotely uh, should they should they still be doing so. Um, but also thinking about um, beyond the basics. So for those young people who perhaps want to study graphic design at university or computer um, technology and need more sophisticated programs such as Adobe or other programs that um, they have access to those too. So I think it's really important that we think about this beyond just the basics and, and make sure that young people have the opportunities they need to, to succeed. Thanks, Roz. Um, next, we've got Andres, who unsurprisingly, I think, is going to be talking about um, the international perspective and how different countries have used uh, digital technology and responded to the pandemic. So please, uh, Andres. Yeah, thanks so much. And also, it's great to see the leadership of ARC in, uh, in this area. Obviously, you know, this has been a time of massive disruption, but it's also been a time of, you know, unprecedented and I don't think just technological innovation, also social innovation in education and uh, perhaps equally important also social social acceptance of, of technology. So all I'm going to do is just show you a few slides with an international perspective on this. Let me start just to, you know, just highlight the scale of disruption in different education systems. Uh, you can see some countries, the UK among them, actually went quite well through this. You know, school closures have not been as extensive as that, so you can see some countries actually losing almost the entire year. But one point I want to make here is actually that the pandemic itself has is not is a very poor predictor of school closures, actually. Uh, in fact, you know, see almost no relationship between the incidence of infections and uh, school closures. A uh, far better predictor of school school closures is actually the quality of schools and quality of education. You can almost, you know, when you use the PISA scores as a predictor, you can almost perfectly line up, you know, uh, countries with school closures. So what really matters in a pandemic is frontline capacity and resilience in the system. The kind of drivers that produce good results have also helped education systems survive this crisis or not. But what you can also see, like within a country, that across countries, this pandemic is just massively amplified, you know, the gap between countries. Education systems are very resilient, of high quality, you know, coming good through this, others falling further behind. Now, I think that's just as a context. Now, in terms of, you know, solutions, online learning obviously was very popular in OECD countries. Let's talk about the quality in a moment, but it's been rapidly deployed. Uh, materials were distributed. Surprisingly, television in some countries played a very prominent role. 
often combined with mobile phones that where kids didn't have devices, you know, television was used to broadcast lessons and mobile phones were used to do to deal with the interactive parts. Uh, I actually think something we can learn from this pandemic that online learning is maybe the gold standard, but it's certainly not the only tool that is available. So lots of really interesting ideas. I think um, we already heard, you know, how the pandemic has amplified social disparities. I want to show you that with some real time data here. You can see before the pandemic hit, you can see actually access to uh, mathematics kind of online learning program was quite equally distributed across social classes. We didn't see much of disparities between wealthy and poor students. No. When the pandemic hit, you know, everything declined. But then students from privileged backgrounds recovered very quickly, while students from disadvantaged backgrounds were left permanently behind. And I think that's something we need to take away from this experience that we need to do better. So, and I think the devices issue is certainly one of the parts of the equations, but there are others as well. You know, when you ask yourself what was the big kind of challenges uh, in uh, the early years, early childhood education, pre-primary education, it was actually staff resistance to technology. Basically, many staff not believing that that's going to help in education. When you look to school, you see the opposite. Staff resistance was not the issue, but actually not enough tablets or computers for teachers. Lack of teachers' digital skills to use technology for teaching. Lack of internet connectivity in children's homes. Lack of quality of digital technologies and so on. You can really see that, you know, in the early years, it's maybe, you know, uh, kind of attitude barriers. But in the school sector, actually, technology has been a huge, st huge stumbling block uh, in the course of the last year. But a lot has happened in this. That's also very good. You know, we have seen actually subsidized devices, actually almost, you know, eight out of 10 countries have made massive investments to provide all learners uh, with uh, the necessary devices. We have also seen the evolution at the beginning of the pandemic. It was mainly synchronous, you know, solutions, teachers broadcasting their lessons, you know, <laughs> meeting with Zoom and team. Actually, as the pandemic went on, more and more asynchronous learning platforms came into play. And obviously, they are great tools to make learning more adaptive, more, you know, uh, tailored to the needs of students. And that's happened uh, basically in the latter half of last year and this year. We have also seen, you know, investments in infrastructure and in remote areas, support for learners with disabilities. And um, I must say, you know, uh, Rosalind, you're not the first one with uh, with um, the idea to use uh, 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 existing laptops. Actually, the Netherlands was the first uh, education system, and they basically were very, very quick in, you know, procuring, you know, uh, used laptops from companies, from families, and uh, within three weeks, they had every kid in school with a device. Uh, so actually, I think it's a very promising strategy to mobilize existing technology because traditional procurement strategies are just hopeless in a moment of a pandemic. Everybody wants to have computers. So I think they're good examples for how those strategies really, really work. Before I get to the quality of online experience, I want to look at one aspect that is often neglected in this, and that's actually the use of technology to actually build relationships with parents. You know, in a way, uh, before the pandemic, the bars you see here were very, very short. But during the pandemic, something really important has happened. You can see, for example, communication on e-school platforms with parents. No? non-existing before the pandemic now in the majority of systems they are the norm phone calls to students emails holding regular conversations about student progress consulting parents to inform decision making uh, video conferencing te technology providing parents with curriculum material education resources no? in a way education has become much more of a whole of society enterprise and actually i think that's probably one of the most valuable assets we can take with us from this pandemic then actually parents become a real genuine part of the equation and that schools make a real effort to actually integrate parents into those kinds of efforts. You can also see that in the you know attitudes and activities of teachers. Some data from before the pandemic, you can see, for example, it was quite rare that teachers would give parents recommendations about screen time or advice on uh, adult supervised use of technology or 
uh, uh, using technology in appropriate ways. Uh, there was some of that happening in primary schools and in early childhood education, but not very much. But you can see suddenly, you know, in 2020, the bars have in, in some areas doubled. It became normal for actually schools to take more of a role to help actually parents find their way through this. And I think that's something very, very important. How can schools actually become an active player to particularly for parents that do not have the natural resources or inclination to bring them on board and help them. And again, I think hopefully that will stay after the pandemic. You know, we talk a lot about learning losses, but actually recovering social and emotional needs is uh, probably much harder and will take much longer. And there again, building social capital, building relationships, investing in, in trust, is something that has been absolutely key and where technology has played or is playing a very, very important role. Now, finally, I just want to sort of highlight some of the things that we see in terms of uh, digital learning uh, solutions. And I should say they're still quite rare. I think most of the technologies that we see is still about conserving existing pedagogical practice, not so much about transforming it. Uh, at least, you know, when you look at this in, on scale, I think uh, uh, much of what we see is simply, you know, quite, you know, traditional technology being deployed. But there are interesting examples. When you look to countries like Korea, China, Singapore, Estonia, you do find really interesting AI based learning systems now. You know, when you study mathematics on a computer, the computer is studying how you study and then makes your learning much more adaptive, much more interactive, much more granular. And again, this holds huge potential also on the equity front. Uh, students with disabilities can now benefit much better from instruction than the kind of one size fits all lessons. So I think these kinds of technologies are becoming real. And I think in the pandemic, the critical mass has been reached. They're not yet large and large scale, but I think we can see them emerging. We also see interesting new examples of assessment and exams. You know, again, I think one of the most tragic mistakes education has ever made is to divorce learning from assessment. You know, we ask students to pile up a lot of, you know, knowledge. And then one day we ask them, uh, you know, tell me everything you know in a very constrained and artificial environment. And again, you know, we see technology now bringing assessment and learning together, giving students real time feedback on, you know, how to improve, giving teachers a much more interactive feedback on how different students are progressing differently. So those kinds of, you know, assessment systems, also, you know, more complex assessment systems in even vocational settings are starting to get hold and I hope there's a lot of potential. I think the fact that our traditional exams are collapsing in a pandemic should, you know, make us ask ourselves, you know, are our systems resilient enough for an uncertain future? And we need more of those solutions. I already mentioned, you know, learning analytics. Uh, really great potential in this. And uh, the only systems where I've seen that, you know, being deployed at large scale is China, but still it's very worth looking at where teachers really get, you know, very granular real time information of how different students learn differently. And they have completely different possibilities then to, to act, to react, to redesign learning on the go, while not after the lesson and also to accumulate that knowledge afterwards, again, I think it's a very, very important tool. Now, that sounds all, you know, very optimistic and enthusiastic, but I also want to show you a little sort of picture from the reality. Actually, you know, when you look at this, despite all the good examples, when you look at this at scale, we still see that technology intensity in classrooms relates negatively to learning outcomes. You know? Whether it's, you know, playing simulations, uh, providing, uh, posting work on the school website, doing uh, homework on a school computer, almost anything that we ask about tended to be a negative predictor on learning outcomes. This doesn't speak against technology, but it probably says that we are not yet, to, that we do not yet have the kind of pedagogies that really effectively leverage technology. That sometimes, you know, the opportunity cost of the solutions are too high. Sometimes the technical quality of the solutions is uh, too low. I think there's a lot of work that we need to invest to get, you know, those equations right and better. Obviously, you know, there are also selection effects involved. So this data may, you know, overestimate the negative sides of this. But still, I think, you know, we should not get too, you know, enthusiastic 
about the reality. Very last point I want to make is, you know, if we want to really, you know, see this field advancing, we got to see a lot more kind of intellectual and financial capital moving into innovation. You know, uh, when you look at these numbers, global education venture capital is absolutely tiny when you compare that, for example, with the health sector or other kind of sectors of our society. And, you know, in the past 2014, when we started this series, it was mainly a story about the United States. Now it's mainly a story about China. If you look at, you know, Europe, it's just a tiny kind of bit at the in, in green here. So again, I think, you know, if we want to make technology work at scale, probably we have to fundamentally rethink how we configure space, technology uh, and people. Uh, and I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Andreas. Your, your slides are always a, a tour de force. So thank you for that. And uh, finally, we have Rhys, who, again, I think is going to talk a bit about um, the experience of, of Arc Greenwich. Uh, so Rhys, please. Uh, Thanks very much. Well, it's been really fascinating to listen to the perspectives of the previous uh, three speakers. Um, as, as the head teacher of Art Greenwich, uh, um, we were we were feeling this on on the ground floor, very much so. Um, and I think we first started to look seriously at digital technology at this school um, at the start of, of lockdown one, uh, where we knew pupils were, were going to be working from home for an extended period of time. Um, our objective was, was to ensure that no lessons were missed uh, and that all students could continue to receive a, a high quality experience. And we entered into, into early discussions uh, about how we might move all lessons onto a live platform like Team or Teams or, or uh, Zoom. And in the, the five days preceding the, the lockdown one, we kind of set about preparing our community uh, with training and resources. Um, at Art Greenwich, we, we were in a stronger position, I think, than, than perhaps other schools because uh, we had a good standard of on-site technical support and expertise. Um, and, and I also had a group of very willing and adaptable staff who, who were prepared to kind of take on the challenge with both hands. Um, so I think from the very first day of lockdown one, all of our key stage four pupils were receiving every timetabled lesson live online via Teams. Uh, and then we set about systematically onboarding Key Stage 3 uh, over the coming weeks. Uh, Google Classroom allowed us to monitor and provide feedback on, on pupils' progress uh, in real time. And the impact of this work uh, meant that um, attendance to, to online lessons was actually ended up being higher than attendance to school in, in person uh, at the corresponding uh, period of time the previous year. Um, when students returned to, to school, the, the, the learning gaps were, were broadly speaking negligible and we've been able to close any, any remaining gaps relatively quickly. Um, and, and the year 11s um, uh, happily had, had, had returned having covered the full specification and, and they didn't miss a day of learning. So we were really proud of everything that we were able to achieve during the, the lockdown period. But we were also very clear that um, online learning was, was never going to be uh, an adequate substitute for face-to-face for -face, uh, learning with a great ARC Greenwich teacher. Um, and, and during the lockdown, we, we faced a number of barriers. And I think th th there were three main ones that I wanted to kind of pick up on. The first was around kind of technical issues, um, simple things like students accessing passwords, usernames, parents having general kind of technophobia. Uh, and, and of course, something that was mentioned earlier was unreliable internet access. And we had to find practical ways of resolving those issues as quickly as possible. Um, we, we actually facilitated a practice digital learning day in the build up to the second lockdown and that helped to prepare the community. Um, we prepared a number of quick fix videos that helped too. Um, and we had a kind of technical team on, on hand to help kind of man the phones and support during that onboarding period. Um, and, and where all of that failed, students were invited back into community classrooms where we would give them the one-to-one -one support before then, uh, them going away again. Um, the second major issue that, that we faced, particularly as, the, as we went into the second lockdown period, was concerns around excess screen time, screen fatigue, headaches and uh, mental health. And um, we ended up moving to um, 
more of a hybrid model of, of uh, live lessons and paper-based tasks. We introduced um, digital detox afternoons and digital detox days uh, and initiatives across the school to get everybody active again. Uh, but I never really felt like we completely got on top of that particular issue. Uh, and I think finally, there was also the matter of kind of will and, and resilience, uh, motivation and a sense of independence from some of our pupils, typically the pupils that may have been struggling, even if they were but in school to, to, to demonstrate that level of independence. Um, now, to solve that, we were largely relied on the school's culture and, and, and the systems that we that we had embedded for follow up. So, um, as Andreas mentioned, we, we, we actually had a system in place where we were phoning, at least for the first period of lockdown, all of our families on a daily basis. And that really strengthened the relationships uh, and, it, and it allowed us to try to get that message across. Um, we also prepared a, a more firmly worded text message that went to parents if their child wasn't in lessons uh, when they were supposed to be. But there's, for me, there's a big difference between what happens during lockdown to make sure that children can access learning and what now happens moving forward now that children are back in school. And I think we need to make, make that distinct distinction. I think we now find ourselves at a critical moment in our kind of digital journey as a school where, you know, and all credit to, to ARC as a network, we're in a position to be able to issue every single pupil with, with a device uh, to use in kind of normal non-lockdown times. Um, and it's really clear to me that technology has, a, has an important part to play uh, to prepare pupils for this uh, new hybrid world. Um, but, we, but we are potentially at risk of, of embracing technologies for, for technology's sake. Um, and my, my concern sometimes is that, you know, is this potentially the next fad that we might need to, that we might need to avoid? Um, and we've been approaching the question of kind of ongoing digital learning with, with a real element of caution, as, as Lauren mentioned earlier. We're asking ourselves some really kind of fundamental questions. What evidence is there that, that digital technology enhances pupil outcomes in normal times? Um, I remember a, a kind of similar piece of work around 10 years ago where some schools decided to issue every pupil with an iPad. Um, and, uh, you know, we would ask sometimes, where are these iPads now and, and, and how much did they cost and, and what is the legacy of that piece of work? Uh, what platforms are we going to use? Are we going to make available to pupils? And are these the right platforms? We need to think really carefully about that piece of work. Um, how can digital learning platforms be used in a targeted way to systematically enhance pupil progress based on the individual learning needs uh, of, of specific pupils? Um, exams are still written. Um, they're not done on, on a computer. Um, will an over-reliance on online learning during normal times reduce dexterity, um, impact handwriting um, and performance in, in exams? Um, what impact will enhancing screen time have on people's social skills and their mental and physical health during normal times? Um, should we actually be considering a nationwide detox um, around digital technology. We know that children already spend hours on social media and gaming, um, and does learning really need to be digital too during normal times? Uh, I certainly don't have all the answers to, the, to these questions, but, but we're, we are thinking very hard uh, about this at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Rhys. And I think we had a absolutely fantastic and wide ranging overview from the panelists there. Um, I think actually I'm going to crack on with bringing in some um, some questions um, from uh, our audience because um, we've got about 20 minutes left. But before before I do that, I might sort of um, throw in one of my own questions, uh, the, the chair's prerogative. Um, and that is, um, I was very struck by what uh, Andreas said about um, how um, the pandemic had sort of revolutionised sort of uh, parental engagement. So I'd be interested in hearing from from Lauren and and Reese. Have, have, have you seen this much at Arc? Have you has, have you been engaging more with parents, or have have some parents sort of dropped off the grid? I think from a, uh, we've actually just recently done a parent survey and, and um, one of the overwhelmingly positive responses was around actually the parent communication and, and the effectiveness with which schools have 
kept in touch really closely with families. Um, obviously, the, there was lots of reassuring parents and, and providing them with updates about what was happening around COVID in their communities, etc. But also the very regular updates about what what their pupils, what their children were learning. Um, and, I, and I think this is where we really, I mean, Andreas is absolutely right. There's, there's such an opportunity to capitalize on that um, intensity of interaction that parents were having with their children's education over this period of time um, and, and maintaining the best, as I think I described the best bits of that. So, you know, a, a parent having real clarity over what a, a, their child is learning and when and why. And I think help being able to so sort of helping them with the tools to to be able to support even more. I mean, we're doing some work around how can we better support our parents with reading with their children now, because all of our pupils in our primary schools and because all of our pupils have actually got a device, we know that we can actually enable some of that support using that device, but reaching the parents and not just the children. So I think that we we're really exploring how we can we can we can build on on that and that sort of interest that has been sparked in 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 sort of what the the kids are doing and, and reese any reflections but uh brief it if that's okay yes of course i i i completely align with what, what lauren said we, we've certainly seen on the ground floor uh, as greenwich as a microcosm of the network um really enhanced outcomes in terms of our parent survey on communication particularly during the lockdown period um and and, and i think I'd, i the only thing i would add is there are other forums as well around parents evenings um, where um, we've, we've now moved to an online platform and I, and I think this is an area where we're probably never going to go back and that appears to be the, 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 the direction of travel across the piece. Thank you um, and we'll start off with a, a question which we received in advance which was from um, Jamie Kakeldi um, from o Oxford AQA um, who, who asks do you think we will have digital slash on-screen exams in the next five years? Um, and Andreas, perhaps you could sort of uh, kick us up on that. Um, are we seeing any countries which are actually using sort of digital in their public uh, assessments yet? Yeah, absolutely. And I do, they, they, those exams exist and I think they provide so much more engaging and interesting solutions for students to actually demonstrate. You can have, you know, students doing an experiment in a virtual laboratory. I think those things are becoming real. In a way, they often do not lend themselves yet for high stakes solutions, but I think uh, we should perhaps introduce them first in a kind of more lower stakes uh, environment. But they exist and I think they are so much superior than the kind of, you know, exams where we, uh, you know, prescribe the right answers and then just see whether students find those answers now. <clears throat> and I, I'll, I'll ask um, uh, our two representatives from ARC what they think about that. But first, uh, Ros, what would you think about um, sort of online assessments? I mean, presumably, given what you uh, said earlier about uh, laptop poverty, I mean, um, sort of digitizing assessments perhaps um, looks quite sort of high risk and 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 might result in some students um, having an additional a, a disadvantage. Is that something you, you'd be worried about? Yeah, I think. I mean, from our perspective, running the program, we recognise that m most most organisations are going to move to a blended model. So um, we ourselves are going to do a blended program um, when when we're allowed to of in face events and digital events, not least because we can reach more young people. So it it makes more sense to have um, more of an impact. Um, I you know I'm not uh, I'm not going to kind of pretend to be an educational professional and recognise that. Um, I'm not sure about where the, the journey will move to, but of course, if we were to take that approach, it would mean that, you know, we'd have to ensure that every child is able to access that approach. Um, otherwise it's just gonna cause more problems. If I may just add to this, you know, our last PISA assessment, we actually did that in a, in a trial. We gave this assessment both in paper form and in a digital form. And actually we got fewer social disparities in the digital environment than on the paper because actually many young people are much more comfortable to operate in a digital environment than, you know, uh, on a very traditional kind of paper form of assessment. So, you know, I think it, <coughs> there's some promise in that to actually address some of the inequalities through better assessment. Okay. 
I think I'll um, rather than going to the um, to the other two panelists yet. Um, I think I'll push on with another question, um, which is one which we received on the Q and A, which is um, from uh, Chimezi um, uh, Anakwe. Uh, apologies, uh, Chimezi, if I've mispronounced your name. Um, do you think that students, uh, pupils with disabilities, uh, learning and physical disability, were carried along during the pandemic? And obviously, this is something which has come up a lot, um, certainly in my coverage of the pandemic, is concerns about pupils with SEND. Um, Lauren, what, what's the situation been like at, at ARC? Yeah, so I think um, both both within ARC and then more, more broadly in terms of what, what some of um, others have experienced is that one of the um, things that schools have been able to do is, is what, when they were providing their the, the types of online learning that they've been doing, more diagnostic assessment that's been helping to identify quickly the gaps in the learning has been supportive of understanding, you know, where pupils are perhaps starting to fall behind more quickly. And I think that we have seen that um, through the remote provision that we had in place. But actually, there's lots of, of evidence to suggest um, both, both within our network and published that, that the ability to have sort of pre-recorded content has been really supportive for pupils um, with, with learning difficulties or special educational needs where they've been able to slow down the learning a little bit to their own pace so that being able to pause and rewind something if you haven't grasped it first time um, has been shown to, to, to sort of support pupils to learn a little bit more at their own pace so I think when designed in the right way um, it's like anything else when we're, I've seen another one of the questions in the chat is around what pedagogical approaches are right. It's, you know, you need to choose the right pedagogical approach to address the, the sort of learning gap that you're trying to close and think about the best suited um, tool and activity to, to do that, that will, that will perform that, that role for you. So I, I think, I mean, it's inevitably will have been mixed, but I think that there are significant opportunities to better support pupils with, with um, additional needs through the inclusive, inclusion tools are available, immersive reader, et cetera, but also just through people being able to have a bit more control over their learning pace. Absolutely. And, and Andreas, what's the, um, the international picture on, on pupils with, with, with learning disabilities and other disabilities? Have they, does the data suggest that they have um, suffered more than other students uh, during this pandemic? Yeah, you know, I showed you one chart on this and generally you can say that this pandemic has massively amplified almost any form of social inequality, including uh, special education needs. But looking forward and I think uh, sort of following up on what Ray said on this, I do believe that technology has its greatest potential actually to give, you know, students with special needs better learning opportunities. You know, they are the ones who suffer actually a lot from the one size fits all kind of classroom environment. And actually uh, technology can engage with many forms of physical disabilities, but also learning disabilities. I think the adaptive learning approaches that come out of technology, I think hold huge potential. But again, you know, in this pandemic, we haven't seen very much of this because most of the technology was essentially about broadcasting. Uh, so I think at the moment, you can clearly say that this pandemic is, and technology has been, you know, dramatically amplifying inequality. But, you know, I think that's where I would think, you know, the future will uh, be very promising. Sure. Um, uh, next, another question which we received in the Q&A. Um, well, uh, someone who's asked about uh, digital detox days and asked if, if you could uh, elaborate, uh, Reese. and I'll also kind of broadening it out a bit. Obviously, you know, there's been a huge focus um, in recent months and years about um, mobile phones in, in classrooms and, and how this could be sort of pernicious and, and so on. How are you balancing these two things? How are you balancing, um, you know, equipping students with this technology which can help but making sure there's boundaries and so on yeah um so i think to pick up on your your second point first on mobile phones we, we're, we're kind of quite unequivocal in terms of our approach to mobile phones in schools in in our greenwich in that mobile phones are, are not permitted in school cool. um I, I, and i could spend a lot of time talking to you about that um in, in terms of the digital detox, we, we, we felt that we really had to move in, in that direction. Um, particularly during the second lockdown period, we were receiving, you know, we kept in contact with parents very closely um, and we ran a number of 
parent surveys to get some feedback while the lockdown was going on. And what was coming through loud and clear was that um, parents were concerned that their children were spending too much time in front of the screen that was affecting them. Um, so we, we had to move to that. And, and, and what did that look like? Well, the whole school kind of came together to create a, an alternative day, a, a, set, a set of competitions um, where we um, list, listed a range of recommended uh, alternative physical activities that were outside um, in the fresh air. Um, and as a school community, our target was to was to reach 2000 miles. Um, in one day and that could have been cycling or, or running or walking um, and we raised money for a local charity when, when we did it and and it was really successful uh, it was very well received and, and all of the not all of the families but a number of the families kind of got got involved as well uh, and it was a really positive thing to come out of that lockdown period. Thank you Reese. Um, another question um, which has come up in the Q&A which is from uh, Ben uh, Mansell uh, and Ben's asked whether the panel believes that schools can build a long-term digital learning strategy using used and different equipment. And he says that he understands that heaven and earth was moved at the start of the pandemic, but in the future, does that still work? And I think that's a very good question because obviously we have been in this sort of crisis phase, as I said, um, where you, you, um, I was interested by what Andrea said about sort of hopeless uh, procurement processes, and that might sort of um, ring a few bells with um, some schools who are waiting for laptops to arrive from the DfE, but we've now got a, a 1.3 million, I believe. But I mean, Ros, what, what would you say about that? I mean, do you worry that now that students are back in classroom, that some of this kind of political will to, to address this issue of digital poverty could sort of dissipate? Yeah, I think I think it's a really interesting um, question. And, and I guess more broadly, we're very much exploring the positive role employers can play um, in, in social mobility and in the recovery agenda more broadly um, in schools. I mean, um, PwC, who are the sort of number one employer in our social mobility index, do um, a wealth of different things to improve uh, social mobility, including kind of traditional things like work experience and outreach in schools, but they also do quite a lot of mental health um, trainings and they've run a programme in Bradford in particular. So I think in, what was interesting about the pandemic is we saw a very creative approach from different organisations looking at how they could support schools, local communities. And I think there's clearly lots of lessons to be learned from that. And we just need to you know, assess, unpick, see what was successful, what worked, what didn't. Um, I think at the kind of government end, um, yeah, they were, I think, as everyone can agree, slow uh, to roll out devices. And, and, and whilst they have reached a lot of young people, that is not all young people. Um, so we'd like to see more kind of focus and emphasis on that, particularly um, as, as kind of schools adopt out of school learning, um, look at kind of flexible approaches to how students can engage um, outside of the, the school day. And and Lauren, um, I yeah. mean, what okay. do you think about that? So I'd like to come in on that because I think, um, I, I absolutely don't think that, um, you know, we can sustain a digital strategy for schools through donated devices and everything else. Schools have got to um, realise that edu digital learning is likely to become as an important part of the school experience as we move forward. I think um, we need to invest in it with our schools. Um, we're building out the investment plans now so that there's a 10 year funding plan to make sure that they can sustain um, the investment that, that we're putting into, into our devices for pupils. But I also think that um, there will be a cost savings in other areas. So, you know, we spend millions of pounds on printing. To what extent can we reduce that annual printing cost um, to, to invest more in devices? So it's not all extra add-on cash, but what I would say, and when you think about the price of a device, you can buy a Chromebook, which will probably last you five years for 160 pounds. If you split that across the life you know the five years that a pupil is in your school it, it is not a very expensive annual cost but the bit that I, I am more worried about actually which is not the devices is the the internet access you know to to look at an annual cost for a dongle for a, a wi-fi dongle for a child might be 120 pounds a year at best you can't a school can't pay for that 
Um, and if families don't have that access, that, that's a huge investment that somebody has to make, or as you know, has been re recommended, we need to look at whitelisting and, and zero tariffing more internet content so that, so that pupils can access things without, without a substantial cost um, at home. Yeah. If I just may, may, may I add to this, you know, I actually think the future cannot lie in, you know, schools all buying their own proprietary solutions because they're all incompatible. I do believe this is a clear case where public policy should put a lot more pressure on the industry to ensure that, you know, whatever devices students bring and the software are all, you know, linking up. When you buy a television set, you expect that you can receive the BBC and everything. In uh, education software, that is not the case. Actually, this is a kind of we will never get a digital ecosystem that works for all if we have a patchwork of incompatible solutions. So I do think there's a clear case for a lot more pressure. But I also wanted to come back to one point that Riz made. You know, if you look at our PISA data in the UK, before the pandemic, 15-year-olds spent almost 40 hours online in British young people. You know, and actually this time is typically negative related to student well-being and to the social emotional kind of outcomes. I, I think something on this uh, needs to be done. I think it's a big role for schools to help young people find, you know, an appropriate balance in their families too. Absolutely. And um, and yes, I, I, I think um, the, the, the point which was also raised um, there about not just uh, devices, but, um, but uh, internet connections, of, of course, is hugely important. I, I believe ARC um, did have a survey uh, recently which found that 34% of parents had a uh, has, has uh, experienced issues with their internet connect connectivity. Um, just, I mean, this is sort of following on from um, what you said just now, Andreas, but um, uh, this is a, a question from Peter Shatwell, um, who's, who's asked, aren't digital devices, laptops inherently distracting? Don't they encourage fragmented attention and multitasking? Um, and is anything being done to adapt technology so it is more limited, more conducive to learning? And and you were just talking there about some of the impacts on on um, social and, and and mental health. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts about that? That, that technology, our technology as we have it today, is just inherently sort of inimical to to concentration and, and well being. I do think there's a great risk. You know, I think there's a great risk that uh, technology makes learning more scripted, more superficial, more reactive. Uh, that's certainly what you see in a lot of the learning software today. I still believe that the future of technology, actually, there's a lot of technology that holds great promise. You know, why would you listen to a teacher explaining the results of an experiment if you can now do that experiment in a virtual laboratory? You know, I think uh, this is where we should be looking to, but I, I would absolutely agree that much of what we see today in edtech is very reductive, very scripted, and actually, you know, also, you know, minimizing the roles of teachers actually it actually constrains you know innovative pedagogy often i think we and i i don't believe we're going to solve those issues unless teachers get at the heart of the design of technological solutions we will never get far if you know the teachers are just implementing you know commercial solutions i think actually the teaching profession really needs to get you know at the center of the research and design of those solutions and actually that's what we see in countries like singapore uh, china japan Estonia, where actually, you know, uh, the education profession has a real role in the de de design of the pedagogies and the development of the technologies. And I think that's really crucial. Okay, um, we're just going to have one more uh, quick question. Um, and then we'll sort of do a, do a sort of wrap up and hear from the panelists on their, their kind of final thoughts. It's another one which came in, um, came in beforehand. So I think we might get run five minutes over, but I've been told that's okay. Um, so it was from uh, Dominic uh, Sals who said, 27% of my YouTube channel said they learned better online than in school. What should we do if this is true? Uh, so so Reese, perhaps you could pick that one up very briefly. I mean, did you have any, did, I mean, it sounds like your kind of online learning went very well, but did you have any pupils who came in and said, you know, we preferred it when we sat at home and had a computer screen between uh, you, myself and the teacher? What are your thoughts about yeah. that? Absolutely. We, we had children who came in and said, um, you know, do you know what? I would much prefer to be sat in my bedroom uh, receiving live uh, online lessons. And uh, I can see the benefits to that uh, for, a, for a teenager. Um, but I think, you know, as, as the professionals, um, I, I, I think we're best placed to to know what's what's best for the for the children. 
Um, and uh, for me, there is much more evidence that points towards um, the quality of learning being much stronger when it's live in a classroom with a teacher surrounded by your friends and your peers to bounce ideas off of and that rich kind of uh, education environment that you get in a school in person. Um, clearly, there is a place for, for online learning. Ab absolutely, there is. And, you know, we're, we're even seeing... Um, fully online schools popping up as alternative provision for some for, for some children um but uh, I, i'm really clear it, that my view is is that um the best place for children is in school in front of their teacher sure um and now um i just sort of invite the pan panelists if they've got any very final thoughts and please sort of very very pithy and and don't feel you have to say something if you feel you've you've said enough already but lauren any anything else which you'd like to mention um, just very quickly, I think there was a great comment question which we haven't come to, which is about that balance between evidence and evaluating new things. And I think to be agile, evaluate, set yourself a baseline, work out where you want technology to have an impact, try something, see if it works. If it doesn't, stop doing it and, and try, you know, try something else. And to be able to do that in a small scale way, I think is, is, is helpful. Great. Uh, Ros, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I'd, I'd just say I think, you know, there really is a crucial role for government to play to ensure that we don't have a kind of two tier system where some of the more innovative schools um, who have jumped on this and who are looking at the evidence are able to offer their young people a much better um, educational system than than schools who don't. So we just need to make sure that government are creating a kind of policy framework around this um, and are ensuring that young people have access to education um, at home through sort of better Wi-Fi where it's needed. Great, thank you. Uh, Andreas? You know, I just want to commend ARC actually for the leadership role it takes in, in you know, they said I would, you know, plea for you to be, uh, do well in documenting what went well and what did not, because there's a great risk that after this pandemic, you know, we get back to normal too quickly. And I think the idea should not be, you know, build back better, but build forward differently. And I think we need networks of schools mm -hmm. like this one. Thank you. And, and finally, Rhys. Uh, I, I, would, I would just say that I think digital technology certainly had a really important part to play in, in lockdown. But in a post lockdown world, world, I think we need to think very, very carefully uh, about exactly what we're doing um, and make sure that it is precise and, and targeted uh, and we proceed with, with caution. Thank you. Um, well, well, thank you all for a really fantastic um, session and thank you everyone to everyone who sent in questions. I thought it was a, a really um, fascinating uh, event. And in, in terms of my own reflections, um, I was immensely impressed by, by Lauren and, and Reese and, and um, t taking us through that journey which you went uh, on in ARC to set up, you know, these completely new systems. And I know that um, all the teachers um, and educators who are, who are following this will um, have gone through a very similar journey and, and will have experienced a lot of challenges at the same time. Um, Roz, it was fantastic to, to hear about um, laptop poverty. And obviously this is going to be a huge thing going forward. Um, uh, the, these kind of digital divides, not just around uh, ownership of devices, but around internet connections too, and how, how, sh how we should address it should be done at a national level. Um, and Andres, always, of course, um, really interesting, insightful uh, perspective on, on what's happening in, in, in different countries. Um, and in some ways, quite heartening. It, it seems that, you know, uh, the UK, we, we missed perhaps less schooling than, than other countries, that we were able to stand up these systems relatively quickly, not as quick as the, the Dutch. Um, but also, of course, concerns about, um, I suppose, digital, the digital divides on a global scale and, and how... Um, other other countries will be lacking some of the, the technology which we've been able to benefit from. Um, so a thank you um, to everyone who's tuned into this event. Um, it just leaves me to to give a plug to the next Arc Talks event, which is on the early years, um, and that's going to be on Wednesday, the thirtieth of June. Um, I think there's something which has just popped up in the chat saying how you can register for that. I think there's also a, um, a form, a feedback form, which will be going round, which I'm sure the organisers would really appreciate um, people filling in. Um, and I think that's it, really. So thanks again for everyone for um, spending your time this afternoon 
um, participating in this uh, event uh, and goodbye. Thank you.